Welcome to this hearing of the Joint Committee on Rules of the California Senate and Assembly. Uh, the purpose of today's hearing is to receive a report prepared for us concerning the State Capital Annex uh, project. And um, I will open and then pass the opening to my colleague, Senator Anthony Canella, the uh, vice chair of this committee. And then we'll hear a report from our architectural firm. Um, as we start this hearing, I, I definitely want to begin at the beginning and acknowledge and thank the leadership of Governor Brown, who with his administration, his senior personnel in 2016, initiated a conversation about what to do with this annex. Um, it's a peculiarity of my career that in two months before I was married, in July of 1975, the governor signed a bill by former Assembly Rules Chair Leon Ralph, uh, AB 207, moving the funds for the West Wing project into the legislative accounts so the legislature could proceed. And of course, to this day, the West Wing is a beautiful structure. We see people walking through it, walking up to it, sort of gazing at this symbol of our democracy and enjoying it during their visits on a daily basis. And so we come now uh, during the governor's second tenure with the prospect that he might be signing the funding bill that would provide funding for the second half of the state capital facility, a conversation which he himself initiated with the support of his senior team, Mar Maribel Batcher, Secretary of Government Operations, Julie Lee, uh, Director of Operations in the Governor's Office, uh, Mr. Daniel Kim, Director of General Services. Maribel and Daniel Kim and their senior staff met our staff over in the Ziggurat building uh, in the spring of last year to have a long conversation about where we needed to go, what types of studies would be appropriate. And the study we will hear about today is an outgrowth of that conversation with the Governor's senior staff. Also, Jason Kenney, who's the direct Vice uh, Deputy Director of the Real Estate Services Division in DGS actually has accompanied us on trips around the country to look at some state capitals because many states are sort of ahead of us on this curve of looking at old dated legislative facilities and updating them. So there's a lot of pathfinders on this conversation that we've been able to learn from. That was actually our first hearing last summer, hearing from someone who's been in the middle of those projects. Uh, I'm delighted to see our state architect, Chet Widem, here today. He's been very gracious to me uh, in conversation and providing support. Uh, and uh, then on the financial side, we've had active involvement from Keeley Bosler, the cabinet secretary for Governor Brown, and of course, Michael Cohen, uh, director of finance, who uh, was, I've been in his office many a time and he's been in my office helping, uh, helping me and our team just think through what we are doing. Um, so, um, I think this project represents an opportunity for us to do three very important things for the people of California. One is improving access to the building. And uh, we know that the building, the annex was built in 52. It does not have sprinklers, but it also, the, the ADA access is not there. We walk around the building. Those of us walk past these lifts all the time, not realizing how cantankerous they can be, how bulky they can be, how if someone has a, a motorized chair with room for their crutches in the back, that, that that may actually not fit the lifts we provide. So there's many ways in which the building is not welcoming to all Californians. The sheen on the floor does not address people with visual ocular impairments. Um, and even the, the hard surfaces in the corridors affect the noise level that can affect people with hearing issues. So there's many ways we might improve it. And this actually would be in keeping with the original intent of Californians. I, I greatly enjoy the fact that when you're in the West Wing and you walk up and down those staircases, decorating the bottoms of all the new old posts carved in the wood are pineapples, which are a symbol of hospitality because in the 1860s they had to come to the continental US from Hawaii. And it's, it causes me to reflect that when the building opened in the West Wing, everybody who went anywhere in the building using those staircases, everywhere they turned, there's a pineapple. Remind them of the welcoming message of the people's house. It is a marvel to me that the West Wing, with so many great symbols concerning our democracy and welcoming people, 
so rich with symbolism. Then we come to the annex and the symbols are not here. Somehow there is a total fail to carry forward this vision of hospitality and the use of symbols to convey the meaning of our system of government. When you get in the annex, they're just not there. Uh, also, just the idea of supporting greater civic engagement. I think uh, when I first started the building in 1977, what the kids had to see was the county exhibits. Then my first boss in charge of the West Wing added the museum rooms, which was a great leap forward. And now you go to the Getty Museum, the Los Angeles Museum of Natural History, our own Golden State Museum. The technology of interactive exhibits is so much greater. And so I think a building project allows us to weave into it a greater experience for those who would come to learn what our democracy is about and participate. Um, and this supports our civic engagement generally. So um, to conclude, I just want to note um, how we got here was that, and I think this is important for transparency purposes, in December of 2016, uh, shortly after I became rules chair, we prepared a request for information seeking architectural firms with people's house experience to see if they'd be willing to assist us in a study of this building. Uh, we had uh, eventually seven firms submit. We, we used legislative staff to redact all the identifying information from those various proposals. We used a member of my staff and a member of the Senate Assembly staff to review those proposals using a scoring matrix that was prepared by an outside law firm that specializes in construction. So we had a law firm that did this sort of thing as their bread and butter, look at the RFI, tell us how we could score these things, consist with the RFI, train the people that did it. We even made our staff sign non-conflict agreements to establish that that was sort of a squeaky clean process. When they were done, all we knew was that they had the top three. There was no ranking provided. They were not telling us who they thought was the best. They just gave us the top three. And then uh, on a day last year, uh, Senator Canella and I, with Ms. Gravert and Mr. Alvarez, uh, convened presentations where the top firms came and presented. So the firm that we're hearing from today is the firm that went through that process and rose to the top. And so you see that reflected in their work. Um, I do want to remind people that there is an Annex website for anyone who might look here. Um, it's annex.assembly.ca.gov, annex.assembly.ca.gov. And anyone going to that website, even now this morning, as this hearing is underway, will find links to everything, including the report. We've, we've kept that website up throughout the past year to make everything we're doing very accessible. Um, and um, obviously, another object to this is, at the end of the day, we have all those fourth graders who come here, the public who comes here, people who would be unfamiliar with this building. We want this to be a safe building to visit. Uh, so parents who, who send their kids to a delightful day in the Capitol have an assurance that that's how it will unfold. So with that, I just thank you all for being here. And I would turn now to my chair, Senator Cannella, for some remarks. Thank appreciate you, Senator Cannella. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, appreciate your work that you've done on this. You mentioned the People's House, and, I, and this is the People's House, and I think we forget that. We think of this as an office building that we come to every day, and, and I'll be honest, uh, I get confused navigating this building occasionally, and I've been here, this is my eighth year, so I can imagine being a fourth grader in a time of emergency trying to figure your way out of here. And since I've been part of this process, I have started looking up at the ceilings looking for fire sprinklers, and I have not seen one yet. I'm sure there are sprinklers throughout the building, but when we have a standard for every other business in California that says they have to meet you know, these sp specific guidelines, especially with, with, to address or uh, accommodate uh, people with disabilities, and we don't do it. In fact, I, I was up at, uh, on the assembly side on the fourth floor, I think, in the old part of the building, and uh, I was there, there was a, a gentleman in a wheelchair trying to navigate the stairs, and the lift didn't work. And this person is trying to, to do their job and, uh, or, or advocate for whatever they wanted to advocate for, and they could not access the room because the lift didn't work. And I think that's a, that's a real indictment on us and, and how we've kept this building up over the last several years. So uh, I know there are some that are concerned about a new building and the, the potential cost for a new building. But uh, when you think about this building's been around for 60 years, the number of people that, that come through this building every year, I think we owe it to them to
to uh, provide an annex that is accommodating to, to all folks, uh, is safe, has, has fire sprinklers. I, I would like to see a sprinkler occasionally. Uh, so I think this is an important process, and uh, I, I have been impressed uh, thus far with, with the work that's been done. You've been included me on, on everything uh, since I became a part of this process, and it's really an exciting process. And really, uh, very seldom do people get to be involved in something that is historic in nature. And, and this building, uh, if we do it right, could be around for another 60 to 100 years and, and long uh, beyond our lifetimes. And so I think it's important. So again, uh, thank you for including me. Thank you for your work so far. And, and uh, let's get started. So, so uh, as we turn, I will point out that one of the interesting things about undertaking the project right now is we have been we have been building a lot of courthouses around California in, in the last 15 years. And that actually becomes a very important benchmark because we know courthouses have a high degree of security, they have state-of-the-art technology, they have higher than average finishes, they need to have large spaces to accommodate jury pools, the actual courtroom facility themselves. So they require a different type of engineering to accommodate the traffic volumes that move through the courthouses. So one of the interesting things for us in the legislature is at this moment that we're considering what we might do with our annex, we have an awful lot of data concerning very similar buildings being built all over California and the costs associated with them. So it's not, we're not quite flying as blind as you might feel, uh, even though it's a, it is a new issue for us in the legislature, these sorts of public facilities of this scale are being built all over. And that becomes an important benchmark. So with that, um, the firm that we have used is CSHQA, Inc. Uh, they have offices West Sacramento, Boise, Idaho. Uh, they're with us here. We have with us John Mullen, uh, who is the Executive Vice President of CSHQA. Also Mark Gear, a Director and Senior Architect with the firm. Uh, Danielle Weaver, Senior Architect with them. And Steve Wakeman, Principal and Managing Architect uh, here in California for them. Uh, so Mr. Mullen, if you will take us through the report and thank you very much for being here. Thank you for your work. Well, I'd like to start with thanking you all for uh, allowing us to come and uh, discuss this report. Um, there's a lot of pages in it and I think every one of them is worth reading. So what we're gonna do is kind of walk you through uh, how the book was uh, formatted, uh, formatted and uh, our process that we went through to actually develop the report. So starting with, I guess I'd like to talk about um, CSHQA specifically um, and give you kind of an uh, understanding of what our expertise are and what we do. With, uh, with that, I guess I'd like to say that CSHQA has been around for 129 years. None of those guys are still alive. Um, she loves it when I do jokes. Um, our firm started in uh, 18, 89, uh, first as a sole proprietor and then as a partnership and now as a corporation. We have offices in West Sac, Denver, Colorado, and in Boise, Idaho. Uh, we're a firm of around 100 people and one of our expertise is that we've been focusing on are the people's house or capital buildings. The team that worked on this project uh, for the study here has worked on now three capital buildings uh, within the United States in the western uh, sector. Um, in some cases, the projects were ground beginning just at where you guys are at right now, the master planning programming aspect. And in some cases, we were brought in to help rescue projects that were having a hard time continuing. In this case here, we're once again involved at the beginning of the process, which I think is the most important part because it's your first step forward. Um, as we, as we look at this, with the projects we've actually worked on in the past, we have a few things that we can actually offer from our experience that we think are going to be uh, useful uh, through the process. But what I can say is that there's uh, many more aspects due to des designing and developing an expansion to a capital building than you might particularly know at this point in time. One of the first things I would suggest and one of those first things that um, is not necessarily illustrated in a cost or for construction budget is the public notification and the people that work in the building notification. It's very important as you work on these projects that you consider um, your information uh, processing programs. You need to make sure that all the people that are coming to visit your capital building during the construction cycle and during the design cycle because they want to see it for one last time as it currently resides 
um, you need to make sure you have a very well run information program because there will be more people than you ever thought interested in this project as you move forward. One of the next things I think I would like to talk about and we find in every capital building we've ever uh, worked with or been to is that none of them have enough meeting space, conference space, or appropriate hearing spaces. Generally speaking, um, most people have done much like you have. They've added some into their uh, capital complex specifically, and then they've had to do some remoting of that. And a lot of them have actually resorted to the use of electronics for almost um, all of their inclusion of their uh, general population. You have an opportunity in this building to, to actually grasp this subject and move it forward and allow for better hearing space, better meeting space throughout the building. Uh, buildings are symbols of this type, are symbols for the people of the state and for the people of the United States at that. They draw people together and they are the symbol of the uh, government for the people, by the people. As we work on these projects, we have to take into account what that actually means as we're developing uh, designs and as we're developing why people need to be in the building and how the people need to work within the building. Most of the time what we find is that there's conflicts in space use. We've typically found that there's never enough space for all the functional needs within a building, and this building was built 65 years ago for a part-time legislature. It does not currently house what, from our various conversations with the users within the building, house all of the uh, capability that uh, is uh, desired within the building. One thing of, of note, and uh, this is probably something you'll hear a lot about over time, is that the building itself, as constructed, predates all the modern building codes, health safety codes, accessibility codes, and um, security needs of, the, of this period of time. All the buildings we go into typically have aging mechanical, aging electrical, and every single one of them has retrofitted technology. None of these buildings were built with the idea that you were gonna have this kind of technology. Think back 50 years ago, there weren't cell phones. They weren't in prevalent use. Laptops weren't available for people. There were desktops, and if you did have the advantage of having some sort of luggable computer, you could carry around a computer at a four inch screen. Today, they're ubiquitous in every infrastructure, and so those needs to be thought out. And what we need to think about is, what is it gonna be like in 50 years? And make sure that the infrastructure can support that in the future, because now we have a better eye on where our, gov our country is going and our, our world is going. Of Paramount today, as everybody's keenly aware of, is security. Security in these kind of buildings, as I said, they're beacons. Um, making sure you maintain security of all the visitors, make sure you maintain security of all the people that work in the building, and security takes on many different faces. We need to make sure that the building takes into consideration how do you handle a busload of visitors, and how do you handle then a potential fire within the building, and how does everybody get out of the building? That's part of the security concerns that this building um, is actually limited in at this point in time, and Mark Gear in a minute here will talk uh, through some of the building deficiencies that we're um, illustrating within our book. Uh, Buildings of this type typically house separate tenants with similar goals. You end up with the governor's office, you end up with the legislature, and in many cases you end up with elected official offices all in the same building. They all have diff different but similar purposes that they're working towards, and we need to make sure we maintain those kind of aspects of how the government is supposed to work. We need to deal with what the constitutional uh, requirements are, facilitate the access to constituents, maintain the government for the people, by the people, all working in the building and on the building during the construction process. And a lot of people, and this is one of my uh, caveats to all of this, there's a lot of people elected to make a decision about this. Gathering and bringing together everybody with a similar and common vision to be able to proceed ahead is paramount to make the process move smoothly. Um, when we started this project, we started it with essentially five options that we were looking at, and no particular bias to any one of these as we started, but we wanted to start in a conservative nature. We started with the idea that maybe all we really have to do is fix it up. We can keep the building as it is. We can, uh, and, and most architects worth their salt can solve most of the accessibility issues. 
But there's a lot that has to be done in this building, and there is a lot of need to express during our conversations with the users of the building that we cannot overcome just by fixing it up as it is. Uh, we looked at remodeling the building, which is essentially as invasive as pretty much the rest of what I'll be talking about here because you have to move people out of the building to remodel mechanical electrical systems because they have to be maintained for parts of the building and most of these buildings were not actually designed with the idea that you can shut off this office and turn this office on here. So um, generally speaking, you have to relocate out of the building to be able to do a full remodel. And it would not actually um, give you all the benefits in the remodel any much more different than what you would get in uh, simply changing the problems that you currently know that are within the building. Thirdly, as we looked at it, we said then one of the better options might be adding on to the building. So we started out with the idea that what if we just remodeled the parts we had and then add, add on to the building and could we actually satisfy the needs that were expressed to us through our various meetings. As it came to be, we found that it was very difficult working within the existing structural grid within the building and the floor to ceiling heights within the building to be able to facilitate being able to apply all the desires and needs that were expressed to us during our conversations. Ultimately, we came to, um, and the, within the actual bill that uh, put this forward, it was about removing and replacing the building or um, remodeling the building. And so we actually expanded upon that as we went through to say what other options you may have available. Ultimately, we fall upon the remove and replace option within the um, uh, replace this building within um, the existing location. And then we also looked at the option of building a new building or new buildings, as some people may have seen uh, already published at a different point in time, in a different location. Through our report here as we talk, hopefully what you'll see is why we came to the conclusions that we came to. I can tell you that the room move and replace was the one that um, was the most easy to satisfy all of the desires, all the uh, code issues, all the safety issues, and um, all of the needs for the additional square footage within the building. So it would be con um, more consistently done and resolve some of the wayfinding issues that we actually know of. Building in a different location was considered strongly, but was uh, resoundingly resent. Uh, 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 taken off the list because of people did not like the idea of being separated from the chambers and separated from their constituents and having to walk across um, a, a, an area of surface to be able to get back and forth in a timely fashion to be able to make sure that hearings and everything started on time. What I'd like to start with on our next slide here is um, one of, the, one of the quotes that we were provided um, part of the way through the process, and you'll find it within the book, and you'll also find it on the back cover of the book, and it was provided to us by Assemblyman Cooley, which we actually thought was very apropos for actually most of the work that we had been doing, and I'll just read it to you quickly. Uh, the California, California's new capital annex should convey the, to the visitors California's positive and hopeful, hope-filled outlook founded upon a deliberative democracy which unfolds there by welcoming all Californians, engaging all Californians, and safeguarding the future of all Californians, and demonstrating a healthful, accessible, and sustainable design. Let me stop there real quick. So what, essentially what that is saying is that the building should be engaging to everyone. And by demonstrating, being an example for your state, of the kind of architecture and construction you would like to have. While preserving the beauty and vistas of the California Legacy Capital Park and inviting all guests, all of its guests, to explore and take pride in one of the most energy efficient capitals in the nation. I think it's very aspirational and I think it's actually um, historically accurate in what a capital building would like to have done. Next slide, please. Our agenda for what we're going to be presenting to you, and I have Mark Gear here will be talking right after me, and Daniel Weaver will talk a little bit after that. We're going to talk about um, these items that are on the agenda here. Um, the slides will generally start with these titles so you can follow through. One of the other things we'll be showing you is specific pages out of the book so that you can see that what we're really trying to show you is how to read the book and how to follow through the book and why we did what we did within the report. report. 
Next slide, please. Uh, so planning study and summary of study efforts. The purpose for the study, as we were setting out, was to re uh, remedy the existing building deficiencies and enhance the ability of the facility to meet the public and private needs of the people's house. What you'll find within the report is sections associated with information gathering and background, goal setting, which we call design goals. Next slide, please. Planning considerations, of which we have uh, some two dozen planning considerations illustrated within the book. A few of those are such things as um, maintaining the beauty of the historical uh, park, as well as maintaining the hierarchy of the Capitol building. One of our planning considerations is known structural deficiencies. The building itself would have, based on studies provided to us through the DGS um, facility assessment, uh, there's known structural deficiencies for seismic if you were to comply with today's modern building codes. One of the other issues that I think are, is paramount for you to consider is during construction, uh, in all cases except for fix in place, you would need to have what we classify as swing spaces, which are spaces where the people and the occupants of the building as well as the public themselves would be relocated to different locations and the thus precipitating the whole public information system so they know where to go and how to use the Capitol building during construction process. And lastly, I'll just note here, out of the two dozen we have, uh, the direct connect of this building to the Capitol building itself, the uh, historic Capitol building. That has to be done in a very sensitive sort of way. And during construction, that's one of the considerations is making sure that you have not left the environment of the existing historical Capitol building, which will ma be maintained, in, in a state where it can't be utilized because we believe that you can utilize the chambers, you can utilize the hearing spaces and the meeting rooms within the historic capital while this construction goes on. But that will be a planning consideration during the actual design. If I may jump in for just a moment. You betcha. On this point. Uh, one of the challenges we have is that we have the chambers, the historic chambers, but as soon as you step out of the chambers, for example, the Senate side, uh, the Maddie Lounge, the Dave Cox Lounge, the Sergeant's Office, Room 3191, your very useful hearing room. Uh, these are all in the annex. So if you're addressing the annex, you actually affect the functionality of the chambers. And so a long-term strategy has to be how do we retain that functionality for the members. The other, the other aspect of this, and I want to point to this chart that you see down there, that colorful chart on the far wall, that's actually one of the unique value adds of this report done by this firm. As they talked to people, they kept track of where do members spend their time. When a member arrives in the building, what are the things they're doing during the day? And that chart is basically shows that the top, you enter, you head to your office, you can run to a hearing room, you may be present at the hearing room, run to another hearing room, present a bill, back to the hearing room, you can go to see leadership, you can go to caucus, you can go to the chambers, you can visit another member. We get a lot done in a very compact space here in California because of this orientation of West Wing Annex that makes every one of our days extraordinarily productive. And I will say it's actually pretty unique. It's definitely not the Washington model. And most other states, lawmakers end up having to hike all over the place to get their work done. So it sort of degrades what they can knock out in a day. So I think as he talks about this issue of looking at these relationships, I want to just put a flag on that chart because I think that reveals a lot about how we are productive. Um, please continue, pardon me. Uh, thank you, I th actually I, I agree wholeheartedly with what you just talked about. We have um, had the opportunity uh, individually and in different groupings to visit uh, quite a few capital buildings and see how they actually function also and how they've done their renovation projects. I've personally been to about 12 of them on the eastern side of the United States. I haven't got to too many southern uh, capitals, but it's been um, very unique for us because your capital building is in a unique situation where you took a historic capital and you put the office building directly connected to the capital building and that does not happen terribly often. Ultimately, I guess as we walk through our report, we um, 
looked at tabular data, and this is essentially spreadsheets. Um, we looked at the surveys and reports that have been done in the past. Uh, we looked at information that was provided to us that was from the 60s, from the 70s, and some information that we had from the 80s. That information helped feed our understanding of what the desires and needs for the capital were over a long period of time. The world has changed a lot since some of those studies were out there. The government was a part-time legislature, of which it is not now. And the way that the public actually can get to and get information from the capital has changed significantly. Those spreadsheets then tally up the way the current building works and the adjacencies that are currently within the building to look for either advantages or disadvantages associated with that, and as well as then we did projections based on our conversations and based on a programming effort, which we'll talk about later, to how many people uh, the building actually needs, how many hearing rooms the building actually needs, and we, we balance those two um, uh, spreadsheets off of each other. And ultimately, uh, we went through the process of providing you within the book um, conclusions and recommendations. So next slide, please. So now what I want to do is just talk a little bit about what some of those efforts were to create some of those sections within the book. Um, the information gathering and known documents, as I said, was to call through historic documentation, generate um, information based on the known and existing facilities that you currently have, and try to analyze why is it being done that way. It was difficult for us to actually initially understand exactly why all these things went together, but as we went through this process, which we use all of these small bits of details to understand your government, hopefully better than you understand how you work within your own walls, because you're doing a job and we need to be able to see how your ghosts are moving around. Uh, participating in high-level goal-setting meetings. This right here is a poignant time within the project, because what we're looking for is, what would you aspire to have this building do? Does the current building apply well to your aspirations of what you would like this building to do? We went through the process. We talked to uh, capital occupants and leaders to uh, generate a list of goals, which Danielle Weaver will walk you through here in a few minutes. We conducted interviews, as I've mentioned a couple times. Those interviews, we interviewed some 50 plus people and talked to more than that, but um, we didn't actually articulate all their names, but most of those are illustrated within the book. Of the people that sat down with us and gave us information, we told them that we would take their information without bias to the information, and we didn't name anybody for their specific information they gave us, so they'd feel comfortable in telling us anything they wanted to tell us, and we think we got a very honest and open conversation with them. Um, ultimately, what we did is we generated a, a programming document, which I'll, I'll also talk about later on here, uh, which is a spreadsheet of desired rooms and sizes. And eventually here, as I said, we developed um, our recommendations. Next slide, please. Our recommendation, which is illustrated within the book, uh, is that you would remove and replace the existing capital annex and construct the new, appropriately sized, energy efficient capital annex in the same location. Our assumptions are, with that recommendation, that you would comply with all modern codes, all accessibility needs, and be very inclusive in the process. So at this point, tired of hearing me talk, I'm going to pass this on to Mark Gear, who is going to walk you through the existing building deficiencies and then progress to uh, cost evaluation. Thanks, John. This slide that's shown is from page 10 of the planning book. And our presentation this morning is based on the book. And so as John mentioned, we will occasionally show slides direct from the book just to orient you as we go along. And on this, on this page, there's uh, 12, um, 12 deficiencies or 12 general categories for deficiencies that we found within the building. And getting all the deficiencies lumped into different categories is a bit of a challenge. But really what we were looking for here is deficiencies that limit the role of the annex from fully achieving its, its role as a venue for governmental processes, but also for allowing for full public participation. So those were our focus for our building deficiencies. And we'll go through these individually now, but they're located on pages 10 to 30 of, of the book. Uh, first one, life safety building code deficiencies. We've mentioned this before. And, and primarily due to the age of the annex, there are significant 
life safety deficiencies that exist within the building. And just to highlight a few, uh, access to exits, and so what we mean by that is really the, the ability for an, an individual who works in the building or a guest to get to that exit. But along the way, there's gonna be exit width impa impairments. And when we say exit widths, we're talking about widths of hallways, but we're also talking about width of doorways out of spaces, and we're even talking about widths of stairways. So it's, it impacts the horizontal circulation as well as the vertical circulation, just not enough width, simply put. Uh, as mentioned before, the fire sprinkler system is not comprehensive throughout the building. It, there is a limited amount down in, the, in some parts of the basement is where that does exist. And if an, another example of a, a code deficiency is if the, if the building was built today, if this annex was built under, say, modern building codes, it would have more lateral bracing, more seismic bracing, earthquake, earthquake bracing than what this building currently has. The second one is noncompliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, and the California Building Code. And, and again, largely due to the age of the building. And, and, but these are problems that impact those who work in the building, but also impact access for the public to get into the building and to meet with their, meet with their lawmakers. So really, all, pub, all public should have access to this building, this most important people's house, and, and the building should not limit that. And, and in some capacity, right now it does. The spe some specifics of that access are for workspaces, meeting areas, and toilet facilities. The toilet facilities, is, is I'm sure, is generally known are there's too few of them, and when you're in there, they're too small. So just access to those is, is definitely an impediment. Uh, one other uh, slightly more detailed item is uh, in, in, a, in a room such as this, there's ways to have a little bit better enhancements for improved assisted listening systems for those who have the, the public who comes in and, and may be hearing impaired. Sustainable design issues is another deficiency that we identified. And just real simply put, the existing annex is not energy efficient. Uh, this building should strive to be a net zero energy facility, but the existing envelope and the existing systems within the building just don't currently allow that to happen. Another faucet or a couple other faucets of sustainable design though is uh, material and system selection. In a sustainable building, that materials should be long-lasting, should be timeless, easily maintained, and reduce global, global warming potential. And currently, not all the systems and, and finishes in this building meet that criteria. And last but not least, ideally in a sustainable design building, or a building with sustainable design, you have uh, fixtures that are low water use. And so we're talking about sinks, we're talking about toilets, and we're talking about urinals. Overcrowding is, is our fourth deficiency, and this is a significant one. Uh, we heard about this uh, a tremendous amount during our interviews, but we've also observed it firsthand. Uh, probably everybody in this room has observed this firsthand, particularly during, uh, during session, of course. But there's congestion in the hallways, but there's also congestion in the back work areas that a lot of the public may not experience or see. And so there's code impacts to this overcrowding but also the, the overcrowding creates building or creates business inefficiencies. The, this engine doesn't churn quite as well as it could if it had a little more space, a little more, uh, more rooms, more meeting rooms particularly. And the overcrowding though does in, to us limit the public's ability to come in and um, meet with their elected officials or perhaps testify at a public hearing. Next image please. Uh, safety of user concerns, what we're really talking about here is security for the building occupants and guests. And we did during our interviews have discussions, lengthy discussions on security uh, that do need to be addressed, but they basically fall into two general categories. Uh, enhancing technology, the security system should be state of the art, simply put. But also there's some physical enhancements that could be done to the building, and some of these are significant. For example, taking the parking that's currently underneath the building footprint and moving that out from underneath the building footprint. That's a, a physical restraint right now to the building that could be addressed. Confusing wayfinding and public access, and these issues start with the site. 
And when people approach the building, uh, I think a lot of first time users, they want to gravitate toward the historic West Wing. As they approach this, they realize to get in, they need to go over to um, a, a little different area for those, to gain entry through those security checkpoints. And this creates congestion at those checkpoints. And then immediately behind that on the north side, there's the, um, the county displays that creates a bottleneck immediately after entry. But internal circulation, once they're in the building, there is that confusion. And a lot of this is the size of the building. It's inherent in the nature of a building this size and its relationship with the west wing, the, the differences in elevation, but just the, the size of the building. So that wayfinding is an issue that should be, should be addressed. Failing toilet and plumbing systems. Uh, I mentioned before there's insufficient toilet rooms, but also drinking fountains. They should have bottled water fillers ideally on them. And we use the term failing toilet there because we're aware of some uh, failing pipes that have literally burst. There's been some leaks. There's been some problems in the building that are locally on one floor, but also impacted the floor below. That leads to aging mechanical systems. And during the interviews, we, we heard a great deal about problems with thermal comfort. And uh, DGS did get complimented on their response. Problems. You're good. Uh, and last but not least, with the aging mechanical systems, they're just simply not energy efficient. Undersized electrical infrastructure. We did analyze the existing amperage into the building, the electrical juice into the building, and found it to be undersized. In our report, it's in the report, it, it's identified there in more the technical aspects of that, but it is low. But also the power distribution within the building is outdated. For example, if there, if there needs to be a repair done in the building, it appears to us that a large chunk of the building might need to be taken offline to do that repair, as opposed to a more advanced um, or some modern electrical backbone that would enable a little bit more nimble and tactical abilities to do small remodels or upgrades as they need to, as they need to be done. Coincidentally with that, outdated technology. Uh, as the building has grown and technology has grown, the uh, communication systems within the building and to the outside of the building are, they're put where they could fit. That doesn't always meet code uh, and IT closets are not vented. You know, kind of a simple example of the technol technological advancements that could happen. Inadequate conferencing spaces. This is, this is a huge one, and uh, it's a significant problem within the annex. There should be more formal hearing rooms in a variety of sizes, but also more informal spaces. And the informal spaces are, are some of what the public doesn't see, but what we've observed is if there needs to be meetings held within workers uh, who work at those who work in the building, there's just simply no good place for them to do that. And also, though, it limits the ability to the public to come in. Uh, we've heard numerous times of, as the public comes in, there's no good, they want to meet with their, uh, meet with someone, there's no good place to do that. Those can spill out into the hallway. Uh, not an ideal situation. And last but not least, other public and working space deficiencies. Uh, the, what's on the slide there has uh, a number of those on the list. Kind of primarily the misaligned floors is one that I think impacts the, the function of the building. And also though amenities for workers for enhancing their ability to do their jobs in, a, in an expeditious way. Next up, uh, we want to talk about estimated construction costs. And on the next slide, and this is from page 80 of the planning study book, there were three cost evaluations done. The first is removal and replacement of the annex. The other one is new parking structure and a new visitor center and public access. Those are the three costs you see here. And, those, and we did these three separate costs because they really needed to be evaluated differently from one another and we wanted to budget an appropriate amount for each item. So moving into the removal and replacement of the annex, uh, the evaluation was done for pricing of an appropriately sized new annex. Our evaluation was done assuming that new annex would be vacated and the construction would be done all at once. And as John mentioned early, earlier, John alluded to, it's, it's most efficient to do it that way. We, th we feel it's most efficient for the government to maintain its processes 
for the building to be holistically done at once, but also from a construction standpoint, it's most efficient that way as well to try to limit the construction duration. Swing spaces or sp those spaces for relocation that John talked about are, are not in the estimate. And there's, there's three different vehicles for achieving those swing spaces where, where, the, where the business needs to happen during construction. And it could be new construction could be built, new, new square footage could be provided for that. Or it could be uh, existing space be remodeled. Or third could be uh, rental, renting existing spaces. And, and based on our past experience, renting is usually the most cost effective way to go but there may be some combination depending on availability out there that would determine those impacts and those those prices and so that would be a study that would need to be would need to be done our budget construction cost for removal and replacement of the annex is approximately 507 million dollars on the new parking structure on this slide our evaluation included removal of the parking from underneath the building and providing a new parking structure separate from the annex. And the size of this was done by our interviews or, or during the interview process to determine the size of that, but also includes loading dock and governor's parking area. If it, if it remains on site, it probably should be underground to um, maintain views to the Capitol, to maintain the character of the Capitol Mall. It, it doesn't have to be underground, or it doesn't have to be on site. It could be in some adjacent lot. Our, our, our cost is asso assuming it to be underground, adjacent to the Capitol, and we have some rough approximation studies of this, but haven't done any great outlay to see where it would fit. Uh, budget cost, budget construction cost of this, six and a half million. And last, public access visitor center for the 50 plus year lifespan of the building. We want to maximize public access. It's a priority. And these costs address site, is the approach to the site, security entries, but also areas within the annex. The costs do include are pro for providing for a new visitor center for the public. And this would be really an opportunity to improve the visitor experience as they approach the Capitol. It could funnel them into the West Wing where a great deal of them want to go. Um, there's interactive displays that could early be staged in that process, even as early as some of the screening process for that group to go through. So the experience is, is a, a, a good one for them. And that would free up some traffic at some of the other workaday uh, entrances. Also though, in this, in this analysis, we looked at square footage within the annex for wider circulation areas and specifically areas where lawmakers can meet with their constituents. We want, we want to have those, the, the appropriate square footage in the circulation system so that public access is granted. Our budget cost, budget construction cost for public access visitor center is approximately $30 million. Danielle will talk next about design goals, so I'll turn it over to her. Thank you, Mark. Um, the 19 design goals for this project can be found on pages 38 to 64 in your books. Um, these goals were determined to be the most important ideas of the project and will provide the future design team with guidance throughout the design process. The goals emerged from stakeholder work sessions and interviews that John mentioned earlier. But I think it's important that we run through these design goals so that everybody can come, become more familiar with them. The first design goal is transparency and openness. Maintaining transparency and openness is important. Uh, over time, we've had the opportunity to observe numerous state governments in, option, in operation, but most are not as engaging as the state of California. The intent of the new design is to enhance public participation in the governmental process and promote access to members by reorganizing the offices and conference rooms and providing clear pathways around the building. Civic engagement. It's important that the public feel comfortable when visiting the Capitol and participating in the governmental process. Some existing physical barriers hinder this engagement such as inadequately sized conference rooms. 
The new design should provide inviting spaces to participate in governmental proceedings and showcase the people's house. Dignity. Dignity in government fosters pride and cultural identity. Everyone who works in and visits the Capitol should feel a sense of dig dignity and pride from the time they enter the building until they exit the Capitol grounds. The annex design shall provide a quality experience for all users by instilling dignity and pride, as well as by providing a connection to California's culture and history. Entry and the visitor experience. As you all know, the Capitol hosts approximately one and a half to two million visitors a year, including tens of thousands of school children. Um, this leads to very congested entryways and hallways at the county displays, which we've all experienced. The new design will provide the opportunity to dedicate an area for guests and school children to gather for a more meaningful experience. This dedicated area should engage the guests with an interactive displays and be able to accommodate large crowds. There should also be clear direct routes for those wishing to do business within the Capitol. Functionality. A functional design will enable users to efficiently and comfortably carry out their daily activities. It is not physically possible to renovate the current building to function as desired due to its size and structural configuration. For example, we heard from our interviews with users that many conversations occur in the corridors lack to, uh, due to lack of inadequate meeting spaces, which compounds the congestion in the hallways. The new annex design should house all desired functions, including these casual conversation spots in the corridors. The next goal is hierarchy. Hierarchy assigns importance to areas of building through shape, size, location, and level of finish. The principles of hierarchy evident in the historic capital shall be carried throughout the new design of the annex. Currently, as you move between the two buildings, it's evident that the annex was not coordinated at all in the design with the historic capital. Historic connection and relevancy. Currently, there is very little connection between the historic capital and the annex. The misalignment of the floors, as Mark discussed, and the somewhat institutional finishes of the annex give it a drastically different feel. The goal of the annex design should be to strengthen the connection between the annex and historic capital without overshadowing the historic relevancy of the capital. This can be accomplished by introducing similar materials and symbolism that is currently found throughout the historic capital. And one of these symbols is the carved wood bear that you see in the picture here. Next slide. Natural light and views. We heard from almost every stakeholder that natural light and views are very important to the future design of the annex. The new design shall use natural light throughout the building to promote health and well-being. The use of natural light also reduces the need for artificial light, reducing energy consumption and cost. Life safety. As previously noted, the annex does not comply with current building codes. In particular, it's lacking a fire sprinkler system and has insufficient exiting out of the building. Fire sprinkler systems save both building occupants and firefighters' lives. They can also limit damage to building structures during a fire. The new annex design should be designed to meet or exceed all building codes. It shall provide a safe environment for all users, including those working in the building, tour groups, visitors, and school children. Accessibility. Accessibility means providing equal access for all users, regardless of ability. Since the introduction of the American with Disabilities Act, ADA, in 1991, the building has undergone numerous renovations to improve accessibility. However, it has not been able to be brought fully up to the ADA and California Title 24 standards as the law requires due to many barriers within the building. The new annex design shall be fully accessible and promote same route travel for all users. This means 
that seamless equal opportunity access shall be provided to all public accommodations. Accessible design shall extend to all aspects of the building, including stairs, ramps, door hardware, seating, signage, plumbing fixtures, elevators, and much more. The lift that's seen in this picture here is one of those that we would actually like to get rid of and provide access to all that is not out of the way and inconvenient as this lift currently is. Sustainable design. It has been stated that the annex shall set an example for energy efficiency and be amongst the most energy efficient capitals in the United States. Sustainable design not only refers to energy efficiency, but also extends to building materials, daylight, waste, the building site, technology, and all other building systems. The goal would be a minimum of a LEED Silver certification on the building. The new annex design shall also investigate and implement as many sustainable design measures as feasibly possible, including exploring the use of alternate energy consumption systems such as solar panels. Safety of users. Maintaining the safety and security of building users is extremely important. Everything from building access and exiting to parking and fire sprinklers should be considered in the new design. Over time, the building has had to adapt to more stringent security measures, such as the security pavilion seen here in the photo. The new annex shall be designed to integrate current security measures within the design of the building and be flexible to accommodate future measures. If I may jump in just for a moment. Sure. Um, there's a new federal New federal courthouse in downtown Los Angeles that uh, in September of 2016, uh, like three weeks before it opened, a deputy U.S. marshal gave me a tour of this new, new federal courthouse. And the thing that struck me was he said that he was in the room on behalf of the U.S. marshal in Los Angeles County on the day everyone first filed into the room to start a conversation about a new courthouse. And so he, he just expressed this idea that if you get your security team in the conversation early, then you are able to have a, a real strong 360 view of how to make the security thing work securely, and you can integrate it in the design, and that's the most affordable way to go. So that's why last year we had our uh, captain of CHP and our own sergeants in the conversation. So this becomes a very important thing to do early because it is so so needed today, and it becomes more cost effective to start the conversation early. So. Great, thank you. And that's really indicative of the entire process. We would want to bring in all different um, entities, such as security, accessibility, and the different um, people who would have an influence on the design of the process early to have a successful design. Um, mechanical and electrical systems is the next design goal. <coughs> As previously mentioned, the current mechanical and electrical systems within the annex are inefficient and inadequate for the current building needs. New mechanical and electrical systems are not only good for the building users, they're also good for the environment. They provide the opportunity to remove potentially harmful equipment from the building and provide state-of-the-art low-impact equipment. The new annex shall have modern electrical and mechanical systems that are energy efficient, use appropriate amounts of fresh air, have user-friendly controls, and are adaptable to future needs. Technology. When the annex was constructed, the designers could not see or predict the advances in technology in the life our lifetime would see. Over time, technology has been introduced to the building, but is still not up to modern standards. Residing in the tech capital of the world will provide the opportunity to tap into this knowledge and apply it to future design. The new annex should design should integrate modern technology to all spaces through flexible, dedicated pathways, allowing for easy upgrades in the future. Adjacencies. And this is the chart that was referred to um, back there on the board. The future annex design shall consider the needs of all departments and functions to provide a more efficient layout for users and make navigation through the building more intuitive for visitors. 
The California Capitol is unique in its current design in that the historic Capitol building was expanded upon as the state grew rather than building a second office building. This allows all aspects of the government to work closely together and have direct access to the chambers and other ceremonial rooms within the historic Capitol. Unfortunately, the building has once again become too small to house all desired functions. Based on our conversations with users, it is desired to maintain this working adjacency. Presence in the building. Based on our conversations with users, there is a desire to consolidate governmental functions into the annex. This will allow everyone to have a presence in the building and reduce travel time between the various buildings that are currently used. Meeting spaces. Currently, meeting spaces are often overcrowded the building also lacks enough varying sizes of meeting spaces, including informal conference spaces. Upgrades to existing meeting spaces and the addition of new meeting spaces within the current annex building has been hindered by the existing structural column layout, which is not conducive to creating large open spaces. The new design shall offer a variety of meeting space types and incorporate modern technology. Displays. Currently, visitor displays are spread out throughout the building with no dedicated center to orientate oneself. The new annex design shall strive to incorporate enriched visitor displays to promote learning about the state and government. The annex design shall also create pathways for those wanting to experience the history of the capital and those wanting to conduct business within the capital to alleviate congestion and confusion. The last goal is Capitol Park and views to the Capitol. The new annex design shall reinforce the historic importance of the surrounding Capitol Park rather than detract from it. The new design shall strive to maintain views to the historic Capitol and protect memorials within the park. Any added structures must be subservient to the historic Capitol to maintain the stature and beauty of the grand building and surrounding park. Now I think we're going to move on to programming in which John will give you a brief overview of that process. Help uh, define what programming means because um, programming is a word used by all different kinds of industries. In the AE industry, uh, programming is essentially an evaluation of the space needs uh, within a structure and the adjacencies associated with those space needs. Understanding the needs of the annex users um, and how they actually work within the built environment is part of the programming process. The, uh, once again, the diagram that's shown back there as well as one that Danielle mentioned is one of the end results of that. The process itself needs to resolve who needs to be in the building and should be in the building and who doesn't need to be in the building and who doesn't need to be in the building or doesn't want to be in the building. Um, we, we seek through the programming to find out how many square feet the actual building uh, would need to incorporate to be able to satisfy the uh, future of the project and the future needs of the project. And looking at this, we're trying to be a little bit more uh, into the future, not just in what do you need today? What would you need in the future? Next slide. So. On this slide here, what we're, we're going to talk just a little bit about is um, kind of the highlights of the kind of programming that um, we provided. Public engagement was a heavy conversation that we had with everybody about how would you like to um, engage the public to go to what some of what Daniel mentioned and some of what Mark talked about as uh, deficiencies within the building. There needed to be a more clear and spacious area for the public to come into the building to allow them to have their um, uh, use of the building without um, being detrimental to the rest of the functions in there. So the, it was a highlighted importance to get the public's user input on how they use the building and how they'd like to use the building instead of just having us tell them how they get to use the building. Public engagement spaces were part of the programming exercise. We evaluated how big a space is and how many spaces were needed. And a lot of that was in the ways of meeting spaces, uh, hearing spaces and other uh, amenities that allowed people to engage in their government as well as just visit and have a good time in your building. 
Better public waiting spaces uh, was highly uh, sought during the interviews, and so spaces need to be uh, configured in such a way where the public is no longer um, required to sit on benches out in the corridors, which uh, both inhibits exiting as well as does not actually provide them with a very uh, uh, comfortable uh, waiting environment. Uh, we, we would think that there is a potential for lounges or spaces where people could watch the um, legislature in action that could also function as some of these public waiting spaces. Creating additional hearing rooms of varying sizes to provide the public with greater access and engagement to the business of the government was highly desired. We've added in the program, the program score footage, these aspects into the project, which actually um, in most ways brought almost all the hearing spaces back into the Capitol in a consolidated specific location, allowing people to go from one hearing to another hearing, either as a representative of the government or the public trying to attend multiple hearings without having to traverse the lawns or yards outside. More common use area. The planning study identified um, inefficient and uh, essentially a very low number of public utilities that were available. There's no, uh, uh, I guess, there's no limit to the amount of toilet rooms you can put into the building other than you can't be less than a certain number and you guys are well below the, the lowest number for uh, toilet facilities within the building. You could add more and what we would suggest is that through the programming what we decided was that if you're going to have a large number of hearing spaces you'll have um, a consolidated area of toilet facilities available for those because of the large number of visitors that would be there. But throughout the rest of the building, you would have appropriate numbers of toilet facilities, and those were all identified within the program as far as numbers go. Conferencing rooms, work rooms, exit stairs, elevators, all of those which fall within the normal everyday access paths were uh, seen in the previous, in this existing building as being inadequate. And in programming, those numbers were grossed up to allow for uh, better uh, disbursement throughout the building and allow people, um, I guess, better access to those. Consistency of space planning uh, and design was one of the desires by most of the people we talked to. There's too many inconsistent spaces. Um, and it's difficult from office to office to know how, uh, how those are configured. And so some consistency within our model, we uh, identified a certain size of space for a typical office, a typical function, a, t a, a, a typical um, member's office, a, a office suite, and so on uh, was actually identified and that was what was identified within the space program. And clear access pathways, we uh, grossed up the numbers to allow for the congested uh, circulation in certain areas within the building to make sure that it was easy to get around, was safe for fire, um, Protection personnel, um, at, at this point in time, they, there was a, a series of notes saying that when you have a large number of people spread out through the corridors, it's a lot harder for people to gather them together in an emergency situation. In conclusion, our recommendations, and now the reason you're saying two is because I'm going to highlight that programmatically, programmatically we think that the, uh, we need to provide greater public engagement and meeting spaces uh, throughout for the stakeholders and needed by the users within the building, increasing the area of the Capitol Annex building. Ultimately, the, the previous recommendation we stated already stated that. It's just now you can actually see the period after the sentence saying you need more square footage within the building. Uh, so the removal and replacement of the existing Capitol Annex and constructing a new appropriately sized, energy efficient, and I would add in here also code compliant, accessible, Capital Annex building in the same location. That brings us to the end of our um, presentation and we're open for questions. Yes, Senator Leva. Senator Leva. Good morning. Uh, I stepped out for a minute, I apologize, but uh, so if this has been addressed, please tell me to stop talking. <laughs> uh, is there any thought to um, creating additional childcare space? Um, I know we have we offer child care here at the Capitol, but it's woefully inadequate for as many people that work here. Is there any thought to that? Uh, specifically, given? 
specifically we did look at that and that is part of the numbers within the program I don't know I, off the top of my head if we expanded that or contracted that or uh, what that was but um, ours was an initial program to make sure we kind of understood how big the building was uh, there's a lot of flexibility within okay. how all this will uh, play out and so it easily could be part of the process okay great mr. chairman I'd like to put in a plug for additional child care duly noted thank duly you plugged. <laughs> and and one other question I guess I'd know how to uh, phrase it now mr. chairman I would also like to put in a plug um, we have a lot of uh, members who are starting members and staff who are starting to bike to work if maybe when we are thinking about the new garage there's a place in the garage um, for lockers maybe even a couple shower stalls so people could bike to work take a quick shower reduce our carbon footprint keep everybody active and healthy just a, another suggestion well I definitely think that would fit within the sustainable design principles um, it, it is expected that anything we do will pursue appropriate lead certification comply with the governor's directives at a minimum um, and uh, so biking and all manner of things like that I think would be a part of that conversation uh, I, I think that would be a given Great. Uh, Thank you. Uh, if I may I have more on that one for you uh, that was actually included within the parking um, structure already uh, because it was a fairly strong topic where everybody said hey everybody's riding their bikes to work where we're we gonna put our bikes at so uh, I think you're echoed by many of the people we talked to cool. Thank you. if I may turn now to Senator Morlock and then to you Senator Mitchell thank you mr. chair um, I'm just curious uh, now that you've had a fun time reviewing the annex um, could you explain why the design was sort of awkward that you've got assembly members in the basement or and you know we got offices next to elevator doors and do you ever find out why it wasn't I mean do you, did you dig into the rhyme or reason for some of the design features we did actually look at all the kind of historic documents and the complaints that have been happening since the 60s um, <laughs> honestly um, what we what we found is that as you guys grew you ran out of space and people just took whatever space they could possibly do and it's moved and shifted many times throughout its history of being here it was not I don't think intended to have some of these spaces occupied as office spaces because some of those are dreadful office spaces and quite honestly I don't believe most of those actually comply with um, building codes um, at least not today's building codes and I'm pretty sure they may not have complied with building codes at that specific point in time but you you have um, I to, to quote a quote um, the building is a straitjacket for expansion and uh, with that that means that you have to kind of fit whatever you can within the tight envelope that you have and so um, we can't identify why you ultimately put them there but we know that it was because you just had nowhere else to put them I don't believe that was ever the intention of what actually happened are you familiar with the structural steel procurement law in California I don't know that one okay I mean, you might want to check into that it's been kind of an awkward dilemma for projects especially with Caltrans and I just want to know if it's also pertinent to this pertinent to this because uh, I'm getting emails from vendors that are a little frustrated um, I'm concerned about timing and this is maybe a, a multi long question but we were able to build in the county of orange terminal c to the john wayne airport we built it starting about 2007 2008 when we were in a recession we were able to get great bids you know so construction costs were lower because there was just not a lot of going on i was telling the chair that i would tour the construction every six weeks put the hard hat on the hard show you know to the, the shoes uh and the, and the and the employees would say boy just thanks for helping us so we we built that way under budget and, and so we have these economic cycles and so if the state is issuing bonds and everybody's building new school buildings and all this activity is going on we're going to have to compete maybe pay more wait longer and and I'm just curious I know you don't see the future but how do we how do we time it where at the end of the day we say boy did we build this at the right time as we communicate to our constituents that we're doing the right thing I think that's a very good question um, when we did our analysis for um, 
our, our costing, what we did is we took industry standards for what escalation is across a 10-year period, and we took an evaluation of uh, a whole lot of your capital building or your uh, courthouse buildings that got built over that amount of time, and we did an evaluation on that. And what it showed to us is that years ago, there was um, less escalation than there is you're currently experiencing, but overall, that escalation was 2.5. I think today and today's world is a slightly different environment than all other times that we've had as far as construction's gone because there's been a lot of construction going on in the United States in the past several years. We don't have a crystal ball to tell us will that continue. We do know that with, um, with this kind of projects, depending on how you approach them, uh, as you proceed into the design cycle, the design cycle in itself will probably take uh, just to garner enough uh, agreement from everybody that would be involved in the design cycle, probably two years and maybe two and a half years just to get to the point where you're actually ready uh, to do the construction because there's lots of other logistics that have to go on through that process of such as where is everybody moving to um, and uh, er everything else. Um, there, there's a lot of telecommunication issues that come up that how do you remote those to different locations and all these things. So there's a lot of logistics that has to happen before you can actually put a spade in the ground. Um, once that's all done, the construction itself will probably take about uh, three years just to make sure that you do it um, appropriately. It could take a little bit longer, but I, I, I can't believe that in today's society we can't build this building in three years. Um, with that, though, um, depending on what your trends are, if you do decide at this point in time uh, across the state to uh, you've already done a lot of the, uh, the courthouse projects, which was a, a significant construction effort, but if you do rebuild a significant number of your educational facilities across the nation or you have large expanses of construction that go on, that will modify potentially the availability of labor to work on the building. Um, and you will, we, we would suggest that you actually moderate then potentially what the schedule is associated with that so you don't force anything too rapidly that co costs you more money. And so that's why we're giving you a little bit longer period to work this out so you can spread that and make sure you find the manpower available for the construction period as it might fall. Um, by the same token, it might be more cost effective to do it quicker. And so the, uh, the economic analysis of that would actually have to be taken into a place. So if you look forward <coughs> and you can forecast that all those schools will be built here, but we could find a way to actually get this moving forward earlier, you're buying out contracts prior to uh, all those others. It's detrimental to your state in one way or the other. Somebody's going to have to pay a little bit more for their buildings if you try to build them all at the same time. And a general constraint, just an observation for my colleagues on the committee, we, you probably end up timing the project generally to when you would kick it off and when you'd be moving back in to the fall of an odd-numbered year. So it's probably not opportune to be engaged in disruption of offices with wholesale moves of 120 lawmakers in the fall during the election cycle year. Yeah. And, and this, is, this was the case when they did the West Wing. Uh, your key moves happened in the fall. Your key transition from one facility to a new facility happened in the fall of that odd numbered year. So I just, uh, I sort of think we need to look at, the, look at the studies that need to be done, the grounds, the swing space, and we're probably talking for the big moves that need to happen uh, to transition from one established system with all the parts working to support our governance to another established setting with all the parts working to support our governance as happened in the fall of 1921, 19, 2019, 2021. And so you, that, that just becomes a practicality that we have a working seat of government supporting the executive and legislative branch uh, and the welcoming public and we need to do a hurried up transition from one to the other to facilitate progress. So that's another marker that'll affect where we, where we are in the cycle. But we just, I, I think we just, we need to proceed with alacrity and do the planning studies. Um, there are ways to enhance it. One of the things that we did in our process was on a weekly basis, I was sharing with S S Senator Morlock, we put together staff phone calls on a weekly basis to make sure that the architectural team was being able to pick the brain of the team on this end to short cycle things as much as possible. And I think that's sort of thinking we would want to do aggressively on the public's behalf. And, and then you're in control of your schedule. If you've done your work up front, then you can pick the opportune time to proceed. Uh, 
May I turn to Senator Mitchell or do you have a follow-up question? Oh, no, you must turn to Senator Mitchell. Senator Mitchell, thank you. Thank you, you Senator Morlock. <laughs> I want to follow up on my colleague's uh, inquiry with, with regard to child care. Um, and I hope um, that a part of your planning that, that some time and effort will be spent in having conversations with the current vendor there, doing an assessment of available child care slots um, for state employees in the immediate area. I know the facility closed for some time, a period of time, and I'm not sure why. It, it seems to us, kind of on the outside looking in, that it's an obvious that there would be a demand. I know they have a long waiting list, but I would just hope that um, some thought go into and, and collaboration and discussion with people in the early care and education provision business um, to really figure out what kind of care would be greatest utilized by legislative employees. Um, you know, infant care is, is across the state more difficult to find. Um, if it's um, um, sick child care, given the nature of our work, if that is, is um, in greater demand, I just think if we're going to include the construction, it should be thoughtful and strategic and really apply to the actual need of staff as opposed to you, the business plan you would engage in to just build a child care facility that meets general licensing standards, so many infant rooms, et cetera, et cetera. But that we use this opportunity to create a design and the provision of the kind of care um, that uh, legislative staff actually need. Um, it's very costly. Uh, and, and I know that um, um, based on the costs um, charged by previous vendors, sometimes it's been cost prohibitive based on salary levels uh, paid here at the building. So that we need to think about that too. I'm curious if any of the other projects you've been involved in have included child care facilities and what your strategy was in, in building and expanding upon them. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting subject. And I, I think most of the subjects associated with doing a design for this building would include a very deliberative, very thoughtful process for every aspect of it, including just even hearing rooms and meeting spaces. So um, each one of them has a certain level of, uh, I guess, a, an emotional and a, um, I, I guess, a careful thought that needs to go on to them. I think uh, child care, we have talked when we were working in Wyoming, we talked through the process of that because they, they have the same similar problem. They have a lot of people that would like to have their child care local and convenient. Generally speaking, these types of buildings are not conducive, conducive to um, child care. And so I, I guess I would suggest that if it was going to um, be part of the project, the first thing we'd look at is, is there a local adjacent that is easier? Because um, child care has very specific rules that are different than an office building. And so those are some considerations. It doesn't mean it can't be done within the building, though. No. Um, and so it, it's it, I, I believe there's actually numbers in there right now for some of that. Um, we have not, uh, the liberty we have right now is we get to tell you guys this is what your options are and you get to tell us in the future how you would like to use those options. And I, I believe that it's, it, it perfectly could fit within what we are uh, talking about as far as square footage and the, uh, the thought process for it, it means that it would probably need to be on the first floor or it could be higher, but generally speaking, those spaces are, need to be adjacent to the exterior exiting systems. Yeah, of course. And because it's a lot harder to get a whole bunch of young people out of the building, babies in, included, than it is to get adults out of the building. So right. you usually want those on a local, right. you know, first floor kind of exit structure. Yeah. So I, I think it could easily be added in, and I think that all of the spaces and all the conversation <coughs> we just had will require everybody's, um, I, I, I think, attention to make sure we make decisions that aren't our decisions. Right. These are, we're, right. we're an echo of what you guys would desire. Mm -hmm. And so that's why all the way through our report, we talked about what we heard. And it's not what we are gonna tell you have to do. We'll tell you if we think that you have better options or that you're suggesting a bad option, mm -hmm. which I think those are, those are uh, our job. But um, what actually goes into the building is truly up to you guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And, and with that, Mr. Chair, that I would suggest, um, you know, we've talked about and, and um, in terms of our own experience, the experience of staff, the experience of Third House, we talk about the general public in terms of the visiting center, that in terms of a child care facility, that there would be an extra element of due diligence that would be 
um, incumbent upon us to engage in in terms of engaging those who are in the business of constructing and running child care facilities because yes. that's not us mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, as well as an assessment of you know the the general um, offerings in the area and for us to look back at the history to make sure that it is indeed legislative staff who predominantly utilize the facility in the LLB as opposed to other state employees so I think right. that we need to do some homework um, to figure out what our experience has truly been there and to figure out what makes sense for legislative employees to make it affordable so they can access it, um, et cetera. So I think we have to do that due diligence. Well, and I think that fits with the process. You know, last year the hearings was really, the sequence of hearings was to let us on joint rules who hadn't dealt with a building in a generation to start building a common framework of understanding the process, the issues, that was Mr. Hart talking about other constructions, our own general services with uh, Jason Kennedy, our staff, Diane Boyer-Vine. So I think that fits with the idea of how do we build a common framework to understand the choices, the options, how it fits in, specialty rules that may apply uh, that would influence the choice, what is convenient, et cetera. Uh, so I think that just becomes another, another study to support our deliberations. Very good. Uh, so, uh, Senator Morlock. Thank you. Can I have the floor back now, Senator Mitchell? Yeah. You will certainly make Thank, thank you thank so much for your <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a twofold question. It's sort of a marketing question and it's a management question. I've been up here for almost three years and I don't see a CEO around here. I don't see who's, you know, where the buck stops if there's a project. So, uh, we deal or suffer from projects that don't do well. High-speed rail is not popular in my district. People moan and groan, and it's already over budget by billions. Uh, so that's, but who do you blame? And who, who gets, you know, their ears chewed off? So um, when it comes to remodeling or doing something like this, it's always like two times. So when you want to do a bathroom project or a kitchen project, you might as well double the time and double the bid, because you're going to get change orders and you're going to get cost overruns. <clears throat> and so I'm just wondering, how do we, how do we incentivize the project that when you say it's going to take three years and it's going to cost $500 million, which is going to be a fun marketing concern to our constituents when there's homelessness and all these other issues. So how do we, how do we make sure you get, you know, you and the team, all the contractors do the job on time, on budget, and is there the ability for the state to give an incentive to say, if you did everything you're supposed to, you get an attaboy as opposed to just a, a stick all the time. Uh, but even with a stick, we're stuck, right? We don't, you know, if you say it's going to cost 50 million more, 10% overrun, it's like, what do we do? So I'm just wondering who, who around here is in charge because we may term out or, you know, we're, we're, we're just fluid, but I don't, I, I, I don't know that that makes sense, but you've done it for a couple of other states. And so how do we make sure that at the end of the day, we're all happy and we say, thank you. Great. We want to recommend you to everybody else. Well, that would be our goal. Um, as I, as I noted early in my presentation, there's a lot of people empowered to make decisions and wrangling together everybody to make a decision and, and, um, bring to some kind of consensus and a specific direction is very important prior to proceeding with the project and understanding that your naysayers need to be brought along and bought, brought in to the process. Um, our, our inclusive nature of having our whole study done was to include as many people as we could, not just the people we knew that, and we didn't know who would actually like it or not like it, but we want everybody involved because we think by being inclusive, you can give something to everybody that gives them ability to buy into the project. Doing that helps you stop the decision making as you go into construction. What damages projects is decision making after the fact. If you can come to a consolidated, this is what we would like to do, and you can proceed on a fit schedule to that, then the stick portion of it works because you've given the contractor very specific direction to say, do this. But if you say do this, but also kind of do this, or kind of do this, which is the problem with any home renovation, as you mentioned, fixing your bathroom or fixing your kitchen, I would say you have to give, yield some authority to somebody else. And so my wife did our kitchen. 
not me. So she made those decisions. Somebody has to, you have to make sure you agree on what is the path for decision making and what is the path for changing those decisions. Because as you said, you're going to go through, and when we did Idaho, we went through uh, four, four or five legislative bodies and five governors. Mm. There's a lot of possibility for um, the project to go awry during all of those changes. What I would say is that you've already done the right thing. You have uh, the Joint Committee that can make these uh, decisions and set this uh, priority forward. You need to have consistency in that. You need to have one person that is employed for the purposes within the government, and it could be one or two or three, but if you have a hero that you decide this person is employed and for the duration of the project that can remember, and this is why our team who has worked on three capital projects is the same team that got together back in 1998, because consistency of knowledge keeps you on track. And if you change out, if you modify, if you have architectural and engineering staff that change that are in leadership positions, they forget why they're doing what they're doing. And they can't remind other people why they're doing what they're doing. And so I don't have the silver bullet, but I do believe if you stop making decisions at a point and you allow the design team to finish what they're doing and you can accept that that's a good enough solution because this isn't your house, this is the people's house, everybody gets to use it over long periods of time, you, you're not the, as, as, as a legislative body and as the governor, you're, you're not here forever, but ever the government is. And so if we can focus on those kind of targets of that the government is forever and we can make those kind of decisions, I think you can actually task people with the very specific responsibilities that you would like them to take. Thank you, Mr. Mullen. Uh, are you working through DGS then? Uh, currently we're working through you guys. Just through this committee? Yes. Yeah, well, the, the the statute passed in 2016 provides that we will work with DGS. It states, uh, pursuant to an agreement with the Joint Rules Committee. So by statute, the annex is the legislature's building. The governor has the first floor. Uh, it's our responsibility to formulate the plan that we want, and then DGS is our partner. Uh, I would have to say uh, DGS has been a very willing and eager partner Honestly, the 2016 statute uh, was rather optimistic, saying that the Joint Rules Committee would provide direction, because at that time, Joint Rules had not met in 15 or 16 years. So we have actually been working over the last year to kind of systematize a conversation within the legislature so that we actually become a fit partner uh, with the executive branch on this project. So it is, it is contemplated that uh, we would turn to them for all manner of support uh, because of their specialty. And, and uh, they have been supportive, even, even to the extent of traveling with us to look at some other capitals as we were trying to learn. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Um, well, at this point, I just want to thank you. Uh, thank you for your work on this project. Um, and uh, CSHQA, you've done outstanding work for us. Thank you very much for your presentation here today. I want to remind anyone who would be watching this hearing or those in the audience, we do have a website that has been up and running since last year. Uh, it's annex.assembly.ca.gov, annex.assembly.ca.gov. Uh, you can go there. You will find a great deal of information on this project dating to the work over the last year. There is a specific link added today, the Annex Planning Study. So the full study that we've seen a review of is available online. Um, I want to say it's, uh, it is an interesting process as Joint Rules Chair to be participating in this. And I want to share, it's sort of how your life works out, two weeks Two weeks before I was ever an elected official, back in uh, 2003, a letter showed up on my, at my home. And it was one of those little envelopes, you call it the A10 size envelope. And this was a letter, I, I, I'm very proud of this letter, I kid you not, uh, addressed to Mr. Ken Cooley. And it was from US Supreme Court Justice Anthony M. Kennedy 
a letter to my home from Justice Kennedy, from his private offices in D.C. Uh, I was on the threshold of founding the city of Rancho Cordova. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said something in the letter which was directed to that day, July 1st, 2003, but really relates to this whole building project to me. He said, congratulations to you and all of your colleagues for working to reinvigorate the principle of participatory democracy. And then he said, self-government must not be an abstract ideal, but must be a reality. And we must be unceasing in our efforts to make it more effective and respected by our people. So I actually feel that this conversation we are having here in Sacramento about this annex, which has become a straight jacket, which does not welcome all Californians. Uh, to me, I completely share the concern that this be administered in a sound way, cost effectively. Um, but I also feel it's like the justification is if we end up with an annex which is more welcoming to all Californians, where they have a mobility issue, a hearing issue, a visual issue, welcomes them all here, a safe and secure setting so that parents, when they send their fourth graders to the Capitol, know that they are going to have perhaps a life-changing sort of experience by coming here and sort of understand this connection between what happens in the public realm and their life and their ability to aspire to change it. The other envelope I keep next to that one is when I was eight, I wrote a letter to John F. Kennedy. I just think I was a geeky little kid to be sending a letter to the President of the United States. But to think somehow, you know, you can even at that stage make a connection and understand that this could be a part of my life. I feel that's what this building represents. So uh, I do want to plug that website because our very first hearing, we heard from a project manager that's done many state capitals. And the clear message was that while this will seem not something that most of us have been involved in, as you've been involved at the John Wayne Airport, actually, outstanding experience, not typical for all of us. Still, the professionals that work in this space say, you know, a lot of states are doing this. You can do it. You have outstanding resources here. And so I just think we need to, you know, calm our fears, proceed with great diligence, and uh, assemble a strong team, and just move forward a public vision of what the building could be. But so with that, I would just say, Mr. Vice Chair, I think you're good. good. Thank you all for your time today. Uh, oh, thank you, Mr. Morlock, saving me again. Public comment. That concludes my remarks, but public comment. Anyone wishing to make, offer observations today? Could you explain the lapel pin? The lapel pin is a bundle of sticks. And uh, we saw that slide of the door, which had the bear's head on it. But on that set of doors, on the second floor, you would find a bundle of sticks. It is in all the monumental staircases throughout this building. So it is prominent in the staircases whenever people would walk up and down. The bundle of sticks stands for in our system of democracy. Uh, Mr. Morlock's an individual. Mr. Connell's an individual. I'm an individual. Senator Mitchell, Leva, Monning, we are all individuals. But we take that oath of office which binds us together. It is strong and flexible. It goes all the way back to ancient Rome when Mo Roman magistrates would carry the bundle of sticks as a symbol of their office. It's also cast in the iron of every every old lamp in Capitol Park. Mm. It encircles the lamp. So it is the most prominent symbol that early mm. California's gaffes left us of our sister government. In the lamps, in the staircases, in the original second floor doors, and on this book. Uh, so it's uh, our frail but strong democracy. Mm. So having no further public comment, I thank you all for attending and do invite you again to explore the website, see the work that's been done, and the full report is public as of today on that website, and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.